Hi, and welcome back to uh, the final episode of the Pandemic Pup. Um, we, today we are talking about creating calmness. Um, we're here with Sarah Grace Weber <laughs> um, of Furry Elite. Um, and we are gonna be talking about how to calm your puppy down, especially the, the puppies. Um, if you found this uh, series to be helpful or even this particular video, please like it, um, please share it and comment and let us know. Um, and we're always looking for future episodes. We won't be going on weekly, but uh, we will continue to do some live series for you guys. Uh, so Sarah it has a very large background. Um, she is a professional dog trainer. Um, she is a AKC Canine Good Citizens Evaluator. Um, she is also a certified canine conditioning specialist. Um, and that's kind of going to play somewhat of a big role in what we're talking about today. Um, so Sarah, why don't you give us a little bit of your background? Yeah, so growing up, um, I toyed around between going to vet school and going into law enforcement. Um, I'm not very good at science and I'm not really good at English. So basically I wasn't good at school, um, <laughs> but I really like learning. So it's, it's a difficult thing. Uh, it's a nice struggle. Um, and I started towards the track of going into law enforcement. Um, I went to Central Monco Technical High School where I studied public service um, for three years. I got two provide scholarships to the police academy when I was 18. Uh, you can't go to the academy until you're 21. So I had this weird gap where I was like, what do I do with my life? I started dog walking, pet sitting, working in retail, um, grooming, and then it evolved into boarding, grooming, training, daycare to, I want to be a dog trainer. How do I be a dog trainer? Hey, mom and dad, I want to be a dog trainer. And they're like, yeah, like we figured that seems like something you would do and he's really good at it. Um, so that's been kind of my background. It's been pretty fun and exciting. I was raised one of seven. Um, so I have a bunch of siblings where we are loud, crazy, super fun and exciting. Um, and that really helps me work with families very well because I grew up in a chaotic household of people who are self-employed. So their schedule was always weird. It was very different. Sometimes they worked until you know, 1 a.m. Sometimes they worked until 7 p.m. Sometimes they had the day off. Um, we threw in two dogs in the mix of that. So things were always really different and very go with the flow. Um, so that's kind of where I wanted to create a company that was truly based on families, truly based on people who, um, you know, maybe didn't know their schedule all the way or uh, have six children. <laughs> and you know can't carve out an hour to go to class every single week or can't carve out an hour to um you know do a puppy social stuff like that so kind of kind of find this tailored mix and i think that's what we've been pretty good at doing the last few years and i have to say so i um recommend you quite a lot and it is because i love how you work with families particularly with kids i love that you are very flexible um, and those are kind of some of the things that we're going to talk about today. Um, and it goes kind of back to my whole uh, raising dogs is not that much different than kids with the exception of they're clearly dogs and they are not kids <laughs> and how yeah, to do right. that. Um, so um, she, Sarah's great at finding a realistic approaches. Um, some of the things that we've talked about as far as helping prevent or solve separation anxiety you may have tried it. Um, hopefully some of you guys have. Um, if it, some of those things haven't worked or you struggled with them, this is a great episode for you. Um, and, and hopefully we can learn a lot. So um, we've kind of talked about several different things, but if you, Sarah, if you could talk about um, separation anxiety and, and relating it to calmness and why it's important. Yeah. So First, I'd like to start this out by calmness is the absence of over arousal. It's the absence of fear. Um, it's the absence of a super exciting moment happening and a dog being able to um, 
kind of recenter themselves. Um, oh no, someone said they can't hear. Oh, never mind. Anyway, so I read that wrong. English, we were told school wasn't very good. Um, so calmness is the absence of that big jolt of excitement. Um, it's kind of that baseline, like Sunday morning, rainy Monday kind of activity where everyone's kind of like just there. Um, that's what we want to see in dogs. Uh, what we tend to see and what we are seeing in dogs is um, overalls when people come over. So guests or, um, you know, the mailman comes to the door or family leaves the house. Um, but what I want to talk about first is separation anxiety is not the lack of crate training. It's not the lack of um, or the, the inability to create training or, or not wanting to do it or confinement training in general. So what we're seeing right now is, you know, my dog doesn't need to be in the crate because I'm home all day. Or my dog doesn't be left alone because I'm home all day. But again, like kind of why this uh, series was created, there's gonna be a point in time where we do go back to whatever you did before, um, before a pandemic, anything like that. So separation anxiety is the direct result of separation related behavior. So you remove yourself from the situation, what does your dog do? Bark, whine, cry, tear things up. Um, and I know we're gonna kind of talk about the difference between each one of those things. Is your dog tearing stuff up because they're bored? Is your dog tearing stuff up because it's left there and it's just, you have access? Or um, things like, you know, maybe your dog wasn't super comfortable in the crate the first night and you just forgave it kind of thing. Does that answer? <laughs> A small blurb to start. That's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Um, so where do you want to start with that? So I think that the thing that I'm seeing most with my clientele or um, when we first initially have a, a connection, a consultation is I don't want my dog to develop separation and anxiety. What do I do? Um, so the first thing that we tend to see is especially with a new puppy. So a dog from, you know, eight weeks to let's say six months. Um, it's new and exciting. It's really fun. You know, you got this new dog. It's great. Maybe you've never had a dog before. Um, and everything is just the greatest thing in the whole world. And you have plenty of time to train your dog. So you want to be with it all the time. Um, not giving adequate rest is a really big issue we're seeing. Um, so not giving a dog proper time to relax and adjust and kind of just be nice and chill. Um, so we want to look at a few things and I'm going to dive, dive into each one of those in a second. But the big thing, and I really can't stress this enough, especially when it comes to learning and being able to process things appropriately, rest is huge. So we don't want to burn ourselves out. We don't want to burn our dogs out. Um, you're not going to let your phone get to 0%, just like we hopefully aren't going to let ourselves do that. So we want to look at the concept of calmness, because if your dog is really calm throughout the day, if your dog is very um, relaxed, uh, you know, we have low respiration, we have low heart rate, and generally getting that state of, you know, things are here, things are fine. We get a dog who can learn appropriately and we get a dog that can um, just thrive in the environment. Does that make sense to start? That not only does that make sense to start, but I just like to, in my opinion, it's very helpful for me. And I know some of you out there um, to compare it to kids. And yeah. I was thinking about this with my kids. My toddler, if he does not have his nap during the day, he's miserable at night. Yeah. And not only is he miserable at night, where while you may think that maybe he would just crash at night and sleep through the night, that doesn't happen either. He gets overexhausted from being overstimulated all day and then can't sleep at night, even though he didn't take a nap. So it's that calmness that you need. It's similar to puppies um, and dogs in general that need that break. Exactly, exactly. And you know, I, why I don't have human children and why I'm probably <laughs> one of the younger dog trainers in this uh, 
on this page, um, that's truly what we're going to look at. Kind of like if you work, you know, 14 days in a row, or if you, even if you have like six hours with your family straight, by the end of it, you're kind of done and you want to just be left alone. So we want to look at that mindset and how we feel and, and collate that to our dogs. If we have a dog that, you know, say you bring home and a few days later, everyone goes to meet it. Um, that's a lot of things to happen in a very short amount of time. So what we want to do is find an appropriate balance between activity and rest, just in the same sense we do with athletes. Um, so, you know, it's not going to work out five days straight. You're going to have those breaks in between. So what we want to do is kind of find a really nice balance between high energy, running around, getting super tired, but appropriately tired. I think that's what we are going to talk about a lot today is not having that sugar rush and then crashing. It's not running five miles and then going, I'm so exhausted, I can't eat dinner. Um, and even looking at the sense of like, you know, an hour at the dog park, two hours at the dog park, you know, a day of daycare, my dog's so tired, they won't eat dinner. That's a little bit inappropriate. Um, and we want to kind of look at that in the sense of, being mindful of how we get our own energy out and not asking too much or expecting too much of our dogs. Does that make sense? Yes. So how can we prevent that from happening? Yeah. So we can do a few things. First is having a structured schedule is really important. And that also goes into potty training, which we can kind of talk about in a, in a bit too, because I know a lot of people love puppies. Um, having a structured schedule and what we call active relaxation, active rest. That's carving time out for your dog to be in a crate, be in a pen, be in the mud room, uh, laundry room, anywhere they can have their own time, especially in a multi-dog household, which is kind of a, a nice sidebar. Um, so getting time to be just by themselves is really important. It's going to help with the learning process and not getting um, so overtired they can't do a sit, so overtired they can't come when called, or don't want to get up to go for a walk, um, things like that. So we train two different types of things. We train active relaxation and passive relaxation. Active relaxation, we are putting our dogs in a situation to get them to calm down. So that could be a few things. Um, we could look at putting them in a crate putting them in the X-Pen or a baby gate, um, some, again, smaller area, confined area to get them kind of relaxed and settle. We are also going to add on top of that some form of a pacifier. So that could be a stuffed Kong, that could be a lick mat, a bully stick, um, a tendon, which I have one here. So I kind of want to talk about the difference between the types of chews just a little bit um or a hook so anything to kind of give them a little bit of an oral fixation in the same sense we do with a pacifier with a child so what we want to do is help look at self-soothing and not necessarily having them constantly cry it out or, or, or um just wait for them to settle themselves sometimes we do need to aid in that a little bit um, in the same sense we would, you know, use white noise or um, a pacifier or uh, something for a kid to suckle. So we want to kind of really look at that sense, especially when it comes to a puppy teething. Any other questions on that side of things to start? And then we can talk about passive relaxation, which is my favorite thing. Why don't we go ahead and start there? Cool. So passive relaxation is after active relaxation. We've already taught the um, the passive side. It's that dog that's naturally calm, that dog that kind of will settle and um, lay out under uh, under the table or someone comes in and they just kind of just go by themselves. We can also train that. Um, so that's where, you know, training to go to a boundary, to go stay on their bed or stay on a mat, the couch um working on a little bit of tether training and stuff like that so those are the choices to do those things um those are the choices to go kind of hang out and relax rather than getting overly excited overly exuberant when someone comes to the door or when the pizza man comes 
um, or when your you know, four-year-old's running around screaming, is your dog making the choice to kind of just hang out and chill or choice to chase them or nip at their ankles or their butt or um, you know, rip their clothes, stuff like that. So what we wanna do is find a um, nice balance between I am telling my dog to go be calm down and, and lay out and my dog's making that choice to do that anyway, which is something we can train. So how much of that is similar to um, impulse control in your opinion, or is it the same? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's fairly similar. Um, so we want to look at a few things. Um, we can look at temperament of the actual dog, the breed of the dog. So some dogs have a, a more calmer demeanor generally, and then, um, the individual itself. So I train a lot of litter mates, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so one dog might be super crazy and the other might just go lay at my feet when I first come in. Um, so kind of looking at that balance as well, but impulse control or, or lack of it most of the time is due to lack of teaching and the inability to get a dog to focus to start, but we have some dogs that are a little bit more, um, impulsive, we'll do a little bit more daring things in general. Like my German shepherd is going to be a little bit more daring compared to my lab or, um, you know, my sister's mutt is going to be a little bit more reserved compared to, you know, my German Shepherd is going to jump a fence, stuff like that, or just decide to go chase a squirrel or anything like that. So what are some of the ways, um, or do you have specific exercises that you suggest the family do to help train with those things? Yeah. So I think the first is actually making a list of your dog's favorite things to do. Um, so we want to look at at general reinforcers. Um, a reinforcer is actually anything the dog finds valuable. So most people use food or a toy, but what we also wanna look at is the reinforcement of going to chase a squirrel or digging a hole or taking your underwear or stealing socks, stuff like that. So those are all things that dogs will, those are just dog behavior. I wouldn't say they're, well, they're problems. Those are things that dogs were bred to do not stealing socks, but, or underwear, or underwear, <laughs> so it's the, uh, my, my lab comes in, she'll come in with like, if I don't close my laundry room door, she'll come in with socks, so we want to look at management and stuff like that, but looking at like, she was bred to hold things, so we can teach things like that, um, so what we're going to do is a few things, but teaching incompatible behavior, giving an, an alternative to maybe the behavior we didn't like as much, and those are going to be family dependent. I have some families that don't mind if the dogs jump on them or don't mind if the dogs on the furniture or don't mind if their dog goes to chase a squirrel in their backyard, but doesn't want them to do it on a walk, stuff like that. So what we want to do is find favorites, find reinforcers, things that are um, super, super exciting that kind of light your dog up because those are the things your dogs are going to do regardless of if you tell them to do it or not. Um, so we can use those favorites in a more, in a, in, in a different way to kind of decrease inappropriate behavior or increase impulse control. So it's not that they never get to do it. It's you only get to do it in this context. Does that make sense? It certainly does. Now, how do we do that? So we can do a few things. Um, I just worked with a pup who, uh, is a pointer, a GSP. German short hair pointer, if you guys don't, sorry. Um, so, uh, loves to chase squirrels. So we worked on being able to chase those in the backyard and teaching a little bit of a, a look on a walk. Um, teaching a, let's focus on me. We're gonna, our job is to be walking right now. Our job is to be running, to be focused on our little unit. Rather than my backyard, go chase my squirrels away from the pumpkins, go chase my squirrels away from, you know, my um, trees and stuff like that. So I think the really unique thing here is looking at what's the reinforcement to your individual dog. So jumping up on people, um, teaching a sit is what most people do. My dogs know how to hug, so they know who to hug and who to not hug. Um, and then we look at, um, you know, keeping all four feet on the ground, 
but realizing that's more reinforcing. So instead of jumping up, I'm going to bring a toy to my guest or my person and show them that this is a really cool toy that I have and maybe they'll throw it for me. So I think that's kind of what sets us apart as trainers is looking at the things that dogs want to do rather than telling your dog to sit and waiting for a treat and stuff like that. It's finding the things that make them super excited and trying our best to use those to our advantage because some of them are inappropriate and some of them are safety behaviors and we don't want our dog to be jumping up and stealing food off the counter or stealing medication or, um, you know, digging a hole in our yard and under the fence, stuff like that. So I think it's slightly independent to each individual dog, but we have our general dog behavior. We want to kind of look at those as a whole. And aren't there times where some of those behaviors, when focused on too much, be can become a little obsessive and create yeah. more problems than anything, if not managed properly? Absolutely, absolutely. So we want to look at our, our hierarchy of needs. Um, obviously, we want to make sure everyone's safe, and that includes the dog. Um, humans, everyone else aside. So, you know, well, teaching a chase is really fun and exciting for a squirrel, we don't want our dogs to chase our children or to chase us or are a lot of herding breeds. So dogs that will, you know, move people around or move other animals into and corral them. We don't necessarily want those things to be happening, especially when it comes to our breeds that their genetic tendency is to nip, especially backs of heels and ankles. So doing our best to get those appropriate energy outlets in a different way and teach them that, hey, that's not something, well, it's super awesome. We, you know, we don't do it. Um, so looking at a true safety behavior is going to be our first and foremost uh, thing to be doing. Does that answer the immediate question without actually looking at a specific behavior itself? Absolutely. Cool. And we can certainly chat about whatever as far as. So that. how would you suggest to, um, train a dog that it's okay in one situation and not in another. Yeah, so we wanna look at the actual end picture. Um, so, you know, we don't want our dogs to be chewing and ripping up furniture, but we'd like them to certainly chew and not rip up because we don't want those things to happen, especially when it comes to ingestion or anything like that, um, to chew antlers, bones, um, stuff like that. And looking at the actual driver behind the behavior, um, and the emotion behind it. Uh, and then um, with that chewing behavior, trying to get that little fixation out in more appropriate ways when it comes to um, using some, some fun feeder toys or using a appropriate chew. So I tend to see people use, like my dogs will get, they actually have a tendon right now, um, a bully stick or a hoof. Those are their kind of three major groups categories um they would love that to be honest uh i think that thinks that's the greatest thing um utilizing those in appropriate ways and giving them at the correct times so what we typically see is like the witching hour of like between five and, and nine I've, I've even seen or like 11 giving something like that automatically before a behavior starts is going to be the first thing uh, so setting ourselves up for success and setting our families up for success. So when it comes to uh, bedtime, bath time, like dinner and a story, that's, well, awesome to train the dog, maybe not the most appropriate time to be doing that until our dogs get to the point where they can do those, like just chill automatically. Maybe not the most appropriate time to have our puppy with us while we're doing bath time. Um, so those is where that's where I'd use management and use a crate, an X-Pen, a tether, stuff like that. That way it gives us as humans one less thing to be worrying about in the moment. So what we tend to do is accidentally give ourselves too much to do at one point and then get overwhelmed. Um, the same thing can happen with our dogs. We don't want to ask so much of them that they have a temper tantrum. Um, and that's what we typically see. And that's where dogs can kind of get themselves into trouble or we get some accidental nipping. Um, so using a form of a relaxation or a little bit of um, some management with a crate or an X-Pen 
while our dogs are a little bit younger or even while our dogs are newer, um, we've had a lot of um, late age adoptions from many where I had, you know, I worked with a seven year old, which is awesome. Um, dogs that we may might not know yet all the way, um, not setting ourselves up for a little bit of failure or setting our dogs up for failure. So that's where I, I use a little bit of management to help um, stop things before they start until we have an appropriate time to train that behavior. So there are times to train and there's times to manage. And I think that what we need to do is find that nice balance between both, but use appropriate management tools and appropriate training tools. Do you have any, um, we're gonna, we'll kind of hit whatever you wanna talk about quickly or in the next few minutes, but um, we do have a bunch of questions. So I wanna yeah. kind of get to those. And we are opening, Sarah's uh, opened up questions because this is the last video to really any dog related question. Um, Guys, I love dog related questions. We could talk about this for an hours. She will sit here for hours and hours. I may need to go, but uh, well, can all sit here and, and answer questions and stuff. But um, how much time do you, would you say that a anywhere from a puppy and then we can talk adolescent and adult, how much time do they need by themselves? So I think that's definitely age dependent. We look at, at early puppies from ideally six weeks, unless you have a specific issue with the dog, you, you really shouldn't be getting it before then. Um, eight weeks to like, let's talk about like 16 or so. They should be resting big spurts of the day. We are cat people, cats generally sleep most of the day. Um, so I typically recommend like 12 to 14 hours. And I know it sounds like a big gap of time, but we want to look at that's also how much they learn. So again, I don't know too much of the science on, on newborn babies. And, and that's definitely something I'm interested in studying. Um, but they sleep and eat. That's what they do. Maybe like move around a little bit. We want to yeah, don't need to study them. Yeah, that's <laughs> seems pretty accurate. Um, I have, I actually don't have any nephews. I have, I have cousins with kids. Um, hmm. so <laughs> my siblings, I made a pack. Um, so what we want to do is not expect too much of them at that early stage. Um, I like to use the rule of you know, 30 minutes of vigorous activity, and that could be dependent on the individual dog, whether it's just them being up, running around the, the kitchen, or going for a little bit of a walk, um, or, you know, playing with the kids. It should be an additional hour of rest, um, whether that is a crate rest, a pen rest, or trying to get them to settle and sleep somewhere. So we never want to wake a sleeping puppy unless we really have to go and we want to make sure they went to the bathroom, just like we wouldn't ideally wake a sleeping baby. Um, so what we want to do with that is kind of find that balance. And it, again, will depend on individual dogs. Um, but that's the general rule of thumb for adults or adolescents. A, um, usually I follow like hour on, two hours off. So hour of, of play two hours of rest. And that could be crate rest, that could be passive relaxation where they have a, they have a bully stick, they have a Kong, they're kind of just ch hanging out. But those are times where in that relaxation, we're not asking much of them. We're not doing training, unless it's specific times for training as far as someone's coming to the door, we don't want them to do inappropriate behavior, but I don't wanna ask too much of them. Um, it's kind of like if you come home from a long day at work and someone immediately talks to you and you're like, hey, wait, I need like five minutes to put my things down and settle and relax, like come to me in 10 minutes. And I think that ability to communication is really good. And we want to be able to look at that in our dog. I think that what we tend to see is as a society, I think we're pushing dogs too hard and I, and asking too much of them when they're already tired. And that's where incidents happen. That's where my dog's cranky. My toddler's also cranky. I have to put them together because I need to cook dinner um, or, you know, I, I really need to go for, to work. So I need to get my puppy tired. 
so it's mostly been the crate, but I also need to get my kids ready for school. Um, so I think that finding a more appropriate balance between both of those things and being able to split our time and our priorities evenly as best as we can, because we are humans and, and, you know, we have a lot on our, on our plate as, uh, to ensure that everyone's safe and happy and healthy. I think I threw extra things in there, but sorry. <laughs> Wait, all right. Um, do you have anything else you want, want to point out? I mean, one of the things that we kind of talked about is make, just making sure that you're not spending too much time on the exercises with your puppy. Like we talked about the puppy who's being yeah. walked five miles a day. That's probably not okay for that puppy. Yeah. So, you know, and I can, I can add, um, I'll do a post later on, uh, if not early tomorrow, on age-specific activities and exercises, we shouldn't be running our dogs on concrete. Um, we shouldn't be puppies uh, and, and younger dogs. Um, it's not very good on their joints. Um, and we also don't want to look at, you know, physical exercise as the only form of exercise. And I think that um, Sarah Davison, Christine Egbert, they all talked a really good uh, bit on this. And, and so did Deb as well. You know, we want to look at the mental side of it as well. However, we also obviously recognize exercise is appropriate. It's good for our cardiovascular health. It's good to help keep dogs at a healthy, ideal weight. So finding those breed specific things, it doesn't have to be fast endurance. It doesn't have to be sprint, get my heart rate up real quick. If you ever done a Tabata workout, it's short and sweet. 30 minutes on, maybe 10 seconds of rest. That's what I want to see for puppies. And we can use training, sit, downs, touch, uh, so a nose target or, um, you know, get our paws up on something to work our dogs and make them nice and tired. So it doesn't have to be running just in the same sense that our exercise doesn't have to be on a treadmill or an elliptical. We can do other things to get us fit and healthy and tired appropriately, obviously. Um, so I think that it's getting creative and talking with your vet, talking with a trainer um, and stuff like that to make sure that we're looking at the best individual thing for your dog. Where, as you know, my two dogs have different levels of fitness, um, just as my myself and my my twin sister do as well. So we want to kind of look at those things. Great. So we're gonna um, take some questions now. Um, one of the questions that I think kind of summarizes a lot of what this is about. Um, someone wrote in and he said, "I adopted a one-year-old pit bull. He's generally pretty good when he's calm." His easy walk harness has virtually stopped all pulling. The issue is when he gets excited. He basically goes crazy whenever he meets someone new or someone comes into the house. He gets so excited, he jumps all over them, runs around the house, and starts grabbing pillows, kids' toys, shoes, and tries to rip them up. And it takes him a very long time to calm down. Also, when you play with him, he tends to get overexcited and jump all over you, including biting in a playful way, but it can still hurt. And it's it's virtually impossible at that point to get him to calm down. What can I do? Awesome. So we teach this concept of what we call arousal up, arousal down. Um, what we tend to see in train, this is my favorite question. I love it. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm talking really fast. It makes me so happy. So arousal, you guys, I'm a huge nerd if you haven't figured that out in the last hour <laughs> uh, or 30 minutes, or however long we've been talking. So arousal up and arousal down is one of my favorite concepts to teach <clears throat> because in training, what we typically do is a nice, easy setting, whether it's a classroom or a private lesson. Um, and we teach the things like sit and down and touch and how to go to your bed and um, stuff like that. But we never do it at a high state of excitement. Um, so what happens is that training then fails. fails. So what we want to do is work at a high state of arousal work at a point where your dog's a little bit excited, a little happy, um, but not overly excited where they can't listen anymore. So finding a really nice threshold balance for your individual dog is key. So what I like to do before someone comes to the door or um, anything like that to, to ask for a little test, ask your dog something they know very well. If your dog can't respond to its name, or can't do a sit or a, a touch, which is a nose target, they're not in the right mindset. So that automatically is gonna, you know, every, all training is kind of gonna go down out the window. 
So what we want to do is do a little bit of obedience, a little bit of rapid fire to kind of get them in the, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is what I should be doing. This is super awesome. Training is really fun and exciting to get them to then listen when someone comes to the door. Our concept of arousal up, arousal down, using toys, using high energy to then get our dog to sit immediately. So we go really, really high and go, cool, we're all done playing now. Um, it might take them a second or two to be like, oh, if I sit, I get this toy. Or if I sit or down and look at you, something else really fun happens. And we get to move to the next progression, which is a, you know, I get to see someone or someone gets to say hi to me. Um, kind of looking at the, the concept of manners. I'm not going to hug a screen person, ideally speaking, depending on the situation. We might need some distress tolerance. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to interact with someone if they are at 100 and I'm at, you know, I'm coming in as a reasonable adult here. So we want to look at that in the same sense of dogs as well. Kind of, can they listen and focus to start before we ask them anything else? Does that make sense? So one of the questions, when is it unrealistic to, pop, to ask your pup to be calm? In the evenings, about 30 minutes before a walk playtime, our pup gets anxious and eager to go play. Is it mean to ask him to be calm until we go since he has been had some pent up energy? Yeah, so that gets into uh, actually routine um, and how dogs can sense a little bit of time or if we have a pattern, they kind of pick up on that. So um, my dogs used to come in the car with me every day for work and it got to the point where I was doing mobile base so they didn't come with me anymore. And like, we're going in the car today, right? We're going in the car today, right? I'm like, we're just, you're gonna be here. We're gonna go do stuff early and then we're gonna, then I'm gonna go to work. So. It's, it's called anticipation um, or, or predictors of things. So if we've typically followed the same pattern every single day, which most people do, we're, we're very habitual people, um, dogs will pick up on that. So after dinner, we you know, might go for a walk and then we're going to sit on the couch. Or um, after I eat dinner, my humans are going to eat dinner and there might be table scraps. Um, and then I might get to take them kind of things. So kind of doing our best to change that routine up is gonna be really beneficial in, in that sense of not having a predictor of something happening. However, to answer the actual question, because I got on a tangent. So yes, there are unrealistic points where we ask our dog to be calm, um, depending on age and, and ability of training. So we wanna look at those as, a, as an individual unit, as your dog specifically, um, however, if there's a point in time where, you know, our dog's getting really, really excited, but we aren't ready to go yet, or something completely changes and we have to, uh, you know, not do a 30 minute walk and we just go out and go back and go to the bathroom, um, working on flexibility with your dog and, and not every single time does our walk mean we get to go see another dog or uh, going in the car means we're gonna go somewhere like fun, like the dog park. Um, stuff like that. So what I would do is work on a little bit of, in that 30 minute gap, a little bit of calmness and some scatter feeding. Um, working on a little bit of a uh, redirection from that, that excited energy. It's kind of like before you go to, uh, where did I just go? I was really excited. I was going to go away and I was, I was really excited to go to the trip. Or if you're really excited, you're going to go to Disney World something like that and it's the greatest thing and everything's awesome or you're going to get out of school early and it's just you're waiting for that really fun thing to happen you can't focus on anything else um before this live i was like i'm just sitting here waiting to go do this and i didn't do anything else so uh giving a little bit of uh distraction a little bit of um some mindfulness or tools in your toolbox to get your dog to be nice and settled so whether it's fetching a little bit before we do that run or walk or anything like that or, um, you know, doing a quick training exercise to get our dog to just get back to that mindset of like, oh, I, I am polite, I wait, and then we go outside and do the fun thing. Does that answer the question? Not, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think in general, no, it's, it's not mean to ask your dog to wait. 
Yes, that, yeah, that, yeah. that may be the overall answer to that question. <laughs> no, it's not. Just we want to teach, again, impulse control and patience in general. Um, there are mean things we can do, but I wouldn't say that's necessarily one of them. Yeah. Um, patient, your dog learning impulse control is, um, equates to your dog being polite, really. Yeah. Waiting yeah. when you open the door before, um, not just darting out. It can, um, solve a lot of problems, behavioral problems that can arise from having lack of impulse control for sure. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's what we call tolerance of frustration. Something I didn't mention, um, where, you know, you don't get the thing you want immediately what is those things? Does your dog have a temper tantrum? If you don't get your, uh, your switch or your iPad immediately after you come home from school, do you have a temper tantrum or do you wait and realize that waiting is actually, it might get you longer time on that and stuff like that. So it's kind of looking at the, the long-term goal, the, the end reinforcer there, which is to go do the fun thing. If you're inappropriate about it, you might not get to do that as quick as you thought you would. Perfect. Um, how to get my dog not to jump on people when they come over. Treats are not cutting it. She jumps and jumps for a few minutes, even if she's on a leash. Mm -hmm. It's like she expects them to give her a full human hug when they come over. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so your dog's probably in a high state of arousal, uh, where the point where they actually can't take food anymore, um, because someone coming over is really fun and just the greatest thing in the whole world. It's kind of like, uh, before you go to a concert or um, if you have a really big test, uh, you might not eat as much. You might get a little queasy, a little bit nervous. Um, or on the opposite end of the spectrum, stressed out and fearful, um, where your, your dog lacks the inability to take food. So stress, we have positive stress and negative stress. This dog, it sounds like it's experiencing this positive stress. It's really fun and exciting. It's jumpy usually usually speaking so i want to preface that that majority of dogs will i want to phrase this correctly just because i don't know the whole situation so you know it's usually a sign of over arousal which can be good and can be not so good so what i would do is again try to do a little bit of rapid fire cues rapid fire obedience to get your dog to be nice and settled you can also you know, they're utilizing a tether, which is really good. So keeping their dog on leash, that's going to help prevent immediate contact where that behavior is reinforcing now uh, because they get to jump and it's fun. And if someone says, ouch, that really hurt or get your dog off of me or, oh my gosh, you're the cutest dog. This is so much fun and exciting. Don't worry about it. I'm a dog person. It's fine, which is my biggest pet peeve. So what we want to do is give your dog an incompatible behavior, whether it's them being on a tether and not making contact with people being and letting them kind of jump it out um that dog could be in what we call an extinction burst where the behavior gets worse before it gets better um it's kind of like trying for 20 minutes before you're like oh wait never mind they're not coming for me anymore i just will go to sleep or i'll stop doing that behavior um so trying to find out what your dog really likes if that is going to see people teaching them that going to see people is going to happen quicker um so that would be working with a trainer to kind of work on incompatible behaviors and and stuff like that um and i'm going to add to that that um there are occasions in some dogs where when you add food at the wrong time yep. it can cause the dog to get even more ex overexcited or reactive to that yeah it could be a, a also an unintentional pairing of the of a, a different moment. Um, so reinforcement is an experience rather than a, a particular thing. We have, I don't wanna get too sciencey, but primary reinforcers and secondary reinforcers, food's typically a primary one. It's very fun and exciting. We need to eat it, it's great. Um, but if we paired it at the wrong moment accidentally, as soon as someone came through the door, people mean food. And that's where we can see a little bit of overly excited, over excitement and stuff like that. Um, yeah. I. Certainly, I work with a lot of dogs that uh, are kind of come to me after a different trainer. And I often see that when someone it has been training the dog who doesn't necessarily time things appropriately, yeah. where I need to recorrect all that, but the dog 
has issues with the rewards that the owner thinks that they're trying to reward the dog with. Um, yeah. So, um, it could be something as similar as that too. So look out for that as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so another question is our puppy gets hyper whenever he gets on our couch, chewing and digging. But is, other than that is quite calm. I really don't want him to sit. I really want him to sit still with us while he's on the couch. Any advice for that? Yeah, so couch calmness is one of my favorite things to teach, mostly because in the middle of the day, I get to sit on the couch with the dog and it's very fun uh, for me specifically. So what I would do is um, work on, we want to look at the end picture first. We want our dog to be nice and settled. So what does a nice and settled dog look like? A dog that's not digging and chewing on the couch or a dog that's kind of just there hanging out. Um, so we want to work in a... Typically, I teach it down to start, um, so then laying all the way flat, rewarding that behavior and building up um, the anticipation of I am down and still and kind of chill. I take a deep breath. I get something really cool and exciting, whether it is food or they get to keep staying on the couch or uh, a bully stick, stuff like that. So we can also pair those chews with I chill and hang out on the couch. Um, in conjunction, I'd also teach an off. So if the dog's super loud and crazy and being wild only on the couch, it might not be an appropriate time or age to get that dog on the couch. Um, someone's digging at the door. Um, she says, ah, we've been gone for a while. We did all the things already. Uh, the grandparents are watching us because we'll try to be on the computer. So um, not doing calmness, uh, at least not anymore. So. We want to look at those things. Um, we also want to look at, like, do you want your dog on the couch when those things happen? Probably not. Um, we can also do the tether. You can keep your dog on lead on the couch. Um, we also want to be mindful of, we don't want to necessarily trap them on the couch if they want to feel the need to leave. We can teach flight and, and I go off the couch as an option. Any other? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Um, should relaxation time always start as alone time? Typically, yes. Um, because obviously this whole series is based off of separation anxiety. We need to be, uh, to learn that being alone is okay. And this also goes for people. Um, so that learning, you know, not everyone's going to be with you 24 seven or, um, you know, sometimes people need to work or be on the phone and, and can't have be 100% paid attention to you. Um, yes, so I teach relaxation first as being alone. Um, and then we build it to like being settled on a bed while I'm, you know, hanging out or, um, you know, being in a down while I'm eating dinner or stuff like that. Um, we have the foundations first. So teaching how to be alone, alone first and relax is, is the best. Um, how do you handle high energy dogs on rainy days? Awesome, so like my dogs today. Um, so we do a few things. Uh, first, looking at trying to utilize their food in a more appropriate way. So if you don't scatter feed or use a feeder toy, um, which we had talked about the last two weeks, um, definitely utilizing one of those to kind of express mental exercise um also doing fitness inside is a really good option so just like i said previously we don't need to run outside or run on a treadmill to get our energy out um so cardio essentially um utilizing training is a really good way to get our dog to be nice and tired um there's also you can't do too much of it which is good because we're just going to improve behavior and that's awesome and then we get a cool calm and collected dog that everyone wants to be around um, so I think that utilizing things differently, um, is going to be good. Dog parks are awesome depending on where we see them, who's there and stuff like that, or at least, um, dog play. So those are great, but sometimes maybe not the best during rainy days or look at the weather forecast, book daycare, stuff like that at a, at an awesome, uh, facility. And we have a bunch in the area, um, stuff like that. So also kind of being mindful of your schedule. If you're a slam day at work and you know it's raining and you're working from home, 
having things in your toolbox to get your dog's attention, saving those rainy day Kongs or a bully stick for when you're super busy, I think is going to be really good. And then in conjunction, doing some fitness and stuff like that, which we can talk about. You know, that makes a good point that I think we may have not hit as much last time, uh, but those Kongs and um, the chew toys and all that, I don't suggest leaving them around all day or constantly giving them to your dog. It's not going to be helpful in those types of situations. Yeah. Um, So give it to them when you're looking to um, prevent or prevent some of those behaviors or they need something to do um, because it's raining out, but leaving toys around all day, um, it doesn't make them exciting. So make it exciting for them by not giving them access to it at all times. Absolutely, absolutely. It's like we wouldn't um, necessarily put our kid in front of the computer all day um, or we necessarily shouldn't. Um, You know, it's safeguarding those things and and making them a little bit more valuable. Uh, I always tell all of our our clients that have two separate toy bins. Have one that kind of is there and out and I rotate toys out weekly. I rotate toys out for my clients weekly and we have, um, you know, we'll do a dog share. So it's just different toys to different houses stuff like that to make it very fun and exciting. So we haven't used fish licking at in a while. It came out today because it's one of our first days of being rainy and gross. Um, so making it a little bit more fun and it's also going to keep it um, a little bit more challenging and, and just not easy and kind of boring, um, which is good. And we are also going to be putting together some um, video series on some Gate fun games you can play with your dog throughout the winter and rainy days um, because games and learning new tricks. And that's one of the things I love doing with kids is actually having them focus on teaching the dog a trick. Yeah. Keeps kids having so much fun because they think it's so cool. Keeps the dog mentally exercised. So, um, you know, there's tons of different videos. We'll be putting some out on just different games and tricks to do during the winter, especially if we get stuck inside again with COVID. Uh, <laughs> hopefully not, but just in case, we will we'll be putting those out for all of you guys. Um, so another question is, we have an eight-month-old French bulldog puppy. She's great with our six-year-old dog, but is aggressive towards other dogs. What advice, advice do you have? Okay, um, so we want to look at a few key words there. Um, great and aggressive being, being two of them. Um, so is your dog good because your other dog's very submissive or, or, or tolerant of a behavior? Um, whether you're, you know, your eight month old behavior or, um, is your dog actually nervous and timid or, um, overly excited around other dogs? So I think that that's something that, um, videos would be really beneficial for, but what I want to look at is if you think your dog's not having fun or not going to have fun in this situation, give that dog something else to do. Um, so I think that just by the nature of that comment, I'd, I'd like to see more information. I think that meeting with a certified trainer who specializes in behavior, specifically dog to dog play and dog to dog interaction is gonna be the most beneficial thing there. Sorry, sometimes we can't answer questions all the way on the internet. Yeah, my, I would definitely be putting that, uh, uh, adds that the dog is a Staffordshire Terrier, he's great. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Totally different question. I was like, um, right, cool. But <laughs> that is definitely a um, time where you probably want to see a professional trainer. Anytime there's aggression involved, um, it's not something to mess with. Yeah, even if you think your dog's maybe not having fun as well, or if you think your dog's super timid around it, we don't want, you know, extremes. So extremes are they work either over exuberance. Um, or, you know, shut down fearful. So we want to look at all ends of the spectrum there. All right. So another question is what can my son with cerebral, cerebral palsy do to exercise his dog when he can't walk him? He uses a walker, so can't really walk her. The dog is a Staffordshire Terrier who is three. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, we want to look at, at physical limitations of, um, the the handler the the owner um but you know a lot of our our fitness activities we can do 
Um, so I'll, I'll share one that's really easy. Getting your dog to down, stand, and then down. Um, and I'll, I'll actually put a video on this from Penn Vet Working Dog Center um, in, in, the, in the group. Um, things that we don't have to move ground as much, but are gonna get our dog's heart rate up. So we can do it real slow. Um, we can do it at a fast pace as long as your dog is, um, you know, safe, healthy, and, and doesn't have any joint conditions where I'd ask you to talk to your vet. Um, but, you know, getting really creative, um, we can do a little bit of fetch and retrievals, um, maybe a flirt pull depending on uh, stability on both ends. Um, but, you know, you don't have to walk your dog to get their energy out. And I think that's a good thing. Or we can also... Um, if your son um, can move around as much, we can do uh, bike during where we, we pull a bike, a scooter, stuff like that. But I'd like to look at safety of individual people first um, and then go from there. But there are lots of different things. So, um, you know, my email should be in the link below where I can definitely talk more specifically case by case together, especially when it comes to just safety is my big thing there. Absolutely. And we will be posting your con contact info in the comments. Um, the other thing that I want to move back to that I wanted to share with everyone was a great book that um, I have now re or ordered that Sarah has um, recommended to me. Um, it's great for kids particularly, um, but any owner. So I'm going to go ahead and show you guys that. I think I forgot to fully share it with you. Um, I really like this book. It's something that came out uh, a couple weeks ago, to my knowledge. Uh, we immediately bought it for the team and from for some of our um, some of our clientele, where it goes over stress signals in dogs. Um, and I think that's something that we tend to forgo or, or not talk about as much um, is what our dogs are actually telling us. Uh, it goes over everything from play style to um, what's excitement to what is stress. And sometimes calming signals can be, I'm super, super excited. I need to calm my dog down or I'm really nervous and uncomfortable. I'm not sure what to do here. So I'm going to go do something else. Um, so I really like the book. It is probably only like 10 bucks on Amazon. Um, I think it's super, super useful, um, which is great. Yeah. So the book is doggy language. Um, you see it up here. We did we will be posting a link um, in the comments to Amazon where you can buy it. It was, I think when I bought it, um, less than 11 bucks. Um, yeah. So it's there. Um, any other questions or do you have anything else you want to talk about before we uh, wrap up? Um, I think that there's definitely stuff that I, I'm going to share on the page. Um, so look out for it. Uh, my name on there, Sarah Grace, which we have determined I should probably change to Sarah Weber at some point. Um, so some people know me by Sarah Grace. Some people I know me Sarah, uh, Sarah Weber or Sarah Grace Weber is what's in my email because it didn't confuse people. Um, so I think that definitely trying to get our dogs out, get them tired. But I'm going to challenge you guys to make a list of all your favorite, your dog's favorite things. You might think that they, uh, you might think of something that uh, is a little bit different and fun and exciting. I knew a dog that loved uh, cucumbers. They were the greatest thing in the whole world. Or, um, you know, uh, digging is a big one. But we want to look at all these things dogs were naturally bred to do and try to use them to our advantage because those genetics aren't going to go away. Um, and we don't want to create more inappropriate behavior or behavior that we don't necessarily like, but it's just there. Great. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and thank you everyone who tuned into the episode tonight. It's uh, got a lot of information. There will be a replay on so you can watch it at any time if you missed anything. Um, if you have any additional questions, we'll continue answering them in the thread uh, between Sarah and I. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for putting this together and, and thank you for founding this group. I think it's been pretty cool to look at people who've lived like a couple miles away from me. I'm like, you do dog sports. That's cool. I didn't know that we should be friends now. So it's amazing the people that I've met through the group. Uh, I feel lucky to have done that. So um, I'm excited yeah. for it too. Yeah. Awesome. Guys, have a good night and have fun. Happy uh, Monday. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye.